Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Adam Smith. I'm from the School of English. Um, and I've just finished my PhD on early 18th century political partisan periodicals. But luckily for you guys, that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about something much more exciting than Wigan Tory politics from, the 17, well, from 1715. I'm going to talk about gardening today. Okay. There's a garden growing in the heart of urban, industrial Sheffield. But it's not just any garden. This is, this is an impossible garden. And it's impossible for many reasons. One of the first reasons it's impossible is because it's where it's growing isn't somewhere you'd expect to find a garden. It's growing in the middle of a delightful, safe wasteland called Furnace Park. And in my mind, Furnace Park is a sort of fantastical, magical space where nothing is quite what it seems. I mean, if you just take the name Furnace Park for a second, um, the, the term park's slightly erroneous because... You can't walk your dog there, and it's, it's locked most of the time. It's not really a park. And the, the furnace in the title is actually outside of the park and about five minutes down the road. So already, things that take place in Furnace Park aren't necessarily what you'd expect. The next thing that's slightly unnerving and interesting about this garden is it wasn't put there by gardeners. It wasn't even put there by garden historians. It was actually put there by uh, researchers and students from the School of English, so literary scholars who work on books and print and plays and drama, and emphatically not gardeners. So it's not in a place you'd expect to find a garden, and it wasn't put there by people you'd expect to make in a garden. Um, another really strange and interesting thing about this garden as well is that it's actually anachronistic. This garden is from the 18th century. So there's an 18th century garden growing in the heart of urban industrial Sheffield. But all of those things, they're not why I think it's an impossible garden. They all add to it. But I think it's impossible because this garden, um, as, as I'll explain to you in the next few minutes, is instinctively, intrinsically interdisciplinary. It's a place where lots of different disciplines meet and combine. And we'll hopefully unpack that in the next few minutes. So th this, this garden uh, came about as part of a project which was, could clearly be defined uh, uh, as having two separate strands. So there actually is physically a garden. Um, it was, wasn't put there by gardeners, but there is actually a garden. You can go and visit now. It's got plants in it. It's populated by heritage seeds, which uh, I didn't realize were a thing before I started, but there's a whole industry of people who produce these heritage seeds, um, which, so you can grow 18th century versions of popular plants like you know, peas and asparagus and cabbage. So there is actually physically a garden. You can go and visit it. It's in Furnish Park. If you, if you get it when it's open. Um, but then the second side of the project was the research, and this is where I was involved. Um, so I was doing the research with a couple of M MA students. What we were trying to do is we were trying to think about the relationship between gardens and literature. And I found myself asking this question over and over again um, as, I, as I worked on the project. And that question was, what has any of this got to do with the School of English, and why are we thinking about gardens? What has gardens in the 18th century got to do with books? And it transpired this actually got a lot to do um, with books. In fact, if you look at the print culture from the early 18th century, which is what I did my PhD on, books and gardens are intuitively, symbiotically linked. So this thing, this idea of print culture that I'm talking about, in the early 18th century, suddenly there was a boom in print. Um, it became much cheaper to produce books um, and ephemera and newspapers and periodicals and all of these things. And for the first time, really, almost anybody could, could, be, could print things and almost anyone could buy things. Um, and then you start to get market buy-in and demand and things like that. So you've got, uh, for the first time, taste, artistic taste, isn't really being defined by courts and palaces and royal patronage anymore. Instead, it's been decided by the discerning buy-in member of the public on the street. So what people are buying, entrepreneurial booksellers start to make more of, and suddenly, um, yeah, so that uh, sort of happens. It's not the kings and queens that are deciding what's popular, it's people buying stuff. And it turns out that in the early 18th century, for the first time, people start to have their own blessed plots. They've got their own little garden, and suddenly books start to appear on the market saying, you know, you've got that land, you should really do something with that. But what we couldn't actually... What was really interesting when we looked at this is it wasn't clear whether these books were appearing because people wanted to do something with their garden or if people suddenly wanted to do something with their garden because books were appear appearing to them they should. So you've got this sort of entrepreneurial loop going on, um, which, was, which was really interesting. So you've, it wasn't clear whether the gardens were creating the print or the print was creating the garden. So that was the first surprising thing that we noticed. Um, and then suddenly you've got all these books appearing about gardening, they're all going into libraries, and we realized as we looked into it more that there was actually a similarly symbiotic relationship between gardens and libraries in the 18th century. So I guess gardens and libraries now we might think of as being sort of artistic, non-essential cultural spaces, but we saw in the 18th century these places had a real pragmatic purpose. 
For example, um, healthcare wasn't great in the 18th century. If you got ill, if you got a cold, you know, you could die, as one of our MA students took a lot of pleasure talking about on the internet during the project. There was no sort of NHS or healthcare. So if you got ill, you couldn't just go and buy medicine, you have to grow it. So books start to appear. We actually found one really interesting book, um, which was a combined um, sort of self-diagnosis guide and a gardening guide and a cooking manual. So the idea was you'd get ill, you'd buy this book, you'd put it in your library, you'd open it, and you'd sort of diagnose yourself by working out what symptoms you had, and then it would tell you what medicine you needed to cure yourself, how to grow it, and then how to prepare it. So libraries are suddenly becoming really, really important places. Um, it, ultimately, you know, you're going to survive if you've got a library and a garden. So there was that link there. And this idea of the garden as a medicinal space, we stretched out and did some public engagement activities with some local woodcraft folk. So we had you know, young children coming into the university, and we were talking to them about the garden as a medicinal space. And we actually had them working with 18, well, slight, slightly simplified versions of 18th century textbooks. And we were giving them illness, well, we were telling them they were ill, and they were having to diagnose themselves, and then make replica 18th century remedies. So that was really exciting. And it was because of the 18th century garden that, that, that we were fostering that community. And lots of communities sort of came out of this garden project. As I said earlier, we had hundreds and hundreds of heritage seeds that we wanted to grow um, so that we had this physical place to accompany our research. But there was only three of us in the School of English working on the project. So what we did is we used the Twitter to encourage the people of Sheffield to grow these plants for us and grow these remedies for us. So we had people over Sheffield in places like Fullwood, Attercliffe, Netheredge, growing 18th century plants for us. And then we went round like some sort of crazed horticultural Pied Piper, and collected all the gardens and put them in our fantastical space in Furness Park. So it was sort of, the garden was the product of a community that was fostered by the garden in Sheffield. Um, so the garden is sort of an independent place. It's a solitude. It's your own best of plot. But it was also creating these communities. And, we, and, the, and the thing that ultimately we learned is that in this garden, which is an artistic and creative space, we've also got literature, we've got science, we've got medicine, all meeting. It's about community, but it's also about being individual. It was bundled up with all these contradictions, and that was why it was an impossible garden. Thanks very much. <laughs>